Hello and welcome to the show Kula Simana. This show is basically focused on the open border uh, that lies between Nepal and India and the challenges created due to the misuse of it by some inimical elements. And we even try to talk about some of the steps that are to be taken to mitigate the challenges which try to threat or create a kind of bitterness in between uh, Nepal and India's relation. And uh, in the meantime, we even try to incorporate the, some of the issues which are related to some prospects offered by Open Border itself. And primary objective of this program is to uh, strengthen uh, the historical relation that lies between Nepal and India. And it's been about six months we have been talking about uh, the same issue by inviting the people from different walks of life, leaders of different political parties to diplomats, security uh, uh, experts to uh, analysts, journalists to other stakeholders as well. And at the end of that, uh, we, came to conclusion, uh, we came to conclusion that accountability is one of the important aspects which is required to maintain better relationship between the countries. And uh, uh, why accountability is that important? And how can we make the stakeholders of both the countries more accountable? And to answer these questions, we have invited a, one of the special guests to our show. Uh, he is Mr. Blair Glenn Kors. And uh, he is uh, one of the persons who has uh, done his Masters in International Affairs from one of the renowned universities of U.S., that is uh, John Hopkins University, and he has had an opportunity to work in different parts of the world as well. At the, in the meantime, he has been working in Nepal for last six years, and at the same time, he is the uh, founder director of one organization called Accountability, Accountability Lab. And let us welcome him to this show. Mr. Uh, Glenn Kors, uh, welcome to the show. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, first of all, I'm quite curious to ask you a question. Why you thought of establishing uh, the organization called Accountability Lab? Could you please tell us something in brief about it? Yes, well, thank you so much. The Accountability Lab grew out of uh, an understanding that accountability is really the most important issue mm -hmm. in development. Um, if you think about Nepal, for example, Nepal is a beautiful, wonderful country. It has a huge amount of assets, wonderful people that are very highly skilled, a lot of natural resources, a lot of potential for tourism and power generation and, and so on. But the reason these things don't quite come together in the right way, I think, is, mm -hmm. is accountability and this relationship between people with power uh, and citizens. So the Accountability Lab was set up to really look at this issue and try and come up with creative ways uh, and new, more innovative tools mm -hmm. to generate accountability between decision makers uh, and people. So what we do is we work with particularly young people, the future leaders of this country. The majority of the population of Nepal is under the age of 25. Mm -hmm. And these are the people who are going to be making decisions in the future. Mm -hmm. And we want to help them uh, develop the way that they think uh, about accountability and, and give them the tools that they need um, to, to approach this issue in, in more interesting, uh, engaging, and productive ways. So we do a variety of things. For example, um, here we're um, working with one great team who are crowdsourcing information uh, on public services and putting that online in, in Nepali in a way that people understand to help them navigate uh, government and understand their rights and responsibilities uh, more effectively. Okay. Uh, does this uh, organization work only for Nepal or other countries as well? We also work in parts of Africa mm -hmm. um, because we think that it's very interesting to see what the similarities and differences are across mm -hmm. contexts mm -hmm. and see whether there are lessons that can be learned between countries like Nepal and other countries around the world. Okay. Uh, since uh, you are a student of international affairs as well and uh, our primary objective is to bring, uh, let's say, uh, make bilateral relationship uh, more stronger, much stronger actually between Nepal and India. Uh, what do you think? What are the international practices so far? Uh, why and how accountability is very important uh, in terms of bringing both the countries together and make the relation much better? But what do you think about it? Could you please tell us something about that part as well? Like I said, I think, I think accountability is really the, the central issue and mm -hmm. it's a particularly difficult issue when you're looking at it across borders, mm -hmm. like the border between India and Nepal, which is open, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but the first point to make, I think, is that actually an open border 
is a huge advantage, mm -hmm. not a disadvantage. There are huge economic benefits that come from that. Mm -hmm. um, there's huge potential for, for Nepal. There's about 250 million mm -hmm. Indians within a few hundred miles of the Nepali border mm -hmm. who can come in for tourism, who can come in uh, with skills that are needed for industry, medical tourism in the Terai is increasing. These kind of things, I think, are are useful and important for Nepal and the open border facilitates those. Mm -hmm. There are of course difficult issues that, that come with that, security issues and mm -hmm. smuggling of, of people, of, of weapons, of, of other things, um, mm -hmm. which are difficult, but I think the solutions to those are collective agreement uh, on, on shared ways forward. If you look at one very good example historically, for example, the European mm -hmm. Union, mm -hmm. that began with a coal and steel agreement mm -hmm. between Germany and France that had come out of a brutal war, World War II, and wanted a way to collaborate um, together over specific issues to expand their zone of, of peace and prosperity. And now you look at the European Union, it's a union of 27 countries, it's, it's one of the richest um, regions in, in the world, mm -hmm. um, because they managed to, to look at these specific issues and then expand those outwards. Mm -hmm. For India and Nepal, I think the issue could be, for example, water, mm -hmm. which is a huge um, concern, but also potential advantage because of the the waters that run from Nepal down into India. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that, for example, is one is one key place where the two countries can collaborate and build mutual understanding over shared um, you, concerns. You, you have an opportunity to see the world itself. And a uh, few, 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 few seconds back, you even talked about European Union as well. Uh, what do you think, like, you know, as a student of international affairs and uh, you have been you know, working for this accountability lab as well, what sort of things do we need to learn from uh, the European Union that can best be implemented in the context of Nepal and India mm. so that the relation can be much better and stronger? I think the issue is, is to look beyond security. I think too often mm -hmm. the issues between Nepal and, and India, particularly at the border, are, are viewed in security terms. But security is a function of politics and economics. So if you can look at, for example, economic issues where both countries can agree mm -hmm. and then create systematic ways to approach those issues through joint working groups, um, through high-level government meetings, um, but also through civil society initiatives. I think there are a number of initiatives that are ongoing in the Terai already between Indian and Nepali non-governmental groups that are bringing people together, helping citizens understand each other mm -hmm. at that level, not just at the government level, mm -hmm. um, in a way that I think is really useful. And then it's the, the business and the private sector side of things. Let's, mm -hmm. let's see if there are ways that, that India and Nepal can collaborate mm -hmm. uh, on, on that. I think a four-lane highway between Kathmandu uh, and Patna could do more for security across the region than almost anything else. Mm -hmm. um, so how do we go about creating those kind of um, initiatives that can build mutual understanding and trust. You even had an opportunity to visit different places of uh, border areas, Nepal as well. At times you have even visited India. Mm. You know, like what kind of things that you found the differences so far between uh, the working scenario or working strategies of Nepalese and working strategies of Indian government? Mm. Could you please tell us something about that? Well? A couple of years ago I drove from Kathmandu down to Patna mm -hmm. um, and crossing the border was interesting and it demonstrated some of the differences between India and Nepal. On the Nepali side of the border um, it was completely open, there were no uh, electronic systems for, for documenting who was coming back and forth. Mm -hmm. On the Indian side there was a single window uh, where traders uh, and people driving trucks could go to get all of their forms signed, it was all computerized. Mm -hmm. um, the system was, was a little bit better organized and I think it, it demonstrates some of the things that Nepal could do to improve uh, things on, on this side of mm -hmm. the border okay. to reduce corruption for example if you computerize a lot of systems it cuts down the interaction mm -hmm. um, that people have with, with officials that can potentially engage in that kind of behavior. Mm -hmm. um, I think on security in Bihar Nitish Kumar mm -hmm. has done a very good job uh, with the police um, increasing the standards of policing bringing in high level policemen from around the country to help him look at these kind of issues and enforcing the rule of law through having fast track courts uh, for example and witness protection programs so that people can speak up about things that are happening in their communities and he can deal with those and I think those kind of initiatives on this side of the border would be very welcome too. What are other experiences so far you have experienced because you even got a chance to work in Afghanistan? And how can these kind of security issues which might uh, or have created threat to uh, the relation that lies between Nepal and India, what the things that uh, fundamentally uh, we need to work on, the concern or stakeholders need to work on, mm. w what are those things? I think again it comes down to this accountability issue mm -hmm. and, and helping people understand that they have a responsibility to hold their 
um, decision makers accountable and give them ways to do that. Uh, so in Afghanistan, for example, one very successful program is called the National Solidarity Program, mm -hmm. which is a program, uh, a national program that gives block grants um, to communities in over 30,000 communities in Afghanistan, including in all of the most insecure uh, and dangerous areas. Mm -hmm. uh, and communities then come together and decide how that money is spent, which means the decision making is taken down to the lowest level, mm -hmm. which increases ownership uh, over, the, over the process. And it's been hugely successful in terms of building small scale infrastructure mm -hmm. like dams and irrigation ditches and, and so on. Um, Nepal has been trying to do those kind of community driven programs too. I think looking at how those can be designed and learning lessons from places like Afghanistan might be useful. And in, then in, in, in a context of the developing country like Nepal, uh, because uh, you are uh, working in the field of accountability and uh, trying to make people more accountable on their work, the job that they are assigned with. And how do you think we can make accountable uh, even the local people living both the sides of open border? Hmm. Uh, what kind of works as a student of international affair, you think should be done so that we can uh, truly make the people living at both the sides mm. uh, can be more accountable, which eventually contribute in maintaining better relations. Mm. I think the first step is to make sure that information is transparent and available to citizens, because unless they have information about where money is being spent and how it's being spent, it's difficult to, to make that process mm -hmm. accountable. And there are interesting lessons from the MKSS in India, for example, um, putting budgets up on public walls, painting them on walls so that citizens can see exactly how much the local authorities are spending on, on health, on education. Mm -hmm. And then they begin, can begin to judge for themselves whether that money is being spent effectively. Do you mean that even Nepali government should too, like, you know, should start working on painting and talking about the, you know, I budgets? Think, I think making information transparent in whatever form is most useful, I think, is is really is really interesting and important. Mm -hmm. One thing that they've done in Bihar, for example, is all public officials have to declare their assets, mm -hmm. including policemen. Mm -hmm. So people can see how much they're earning, where that's going, um, and it becomes relatively obvious quickly whether they're stealing money uh, or, or engaging in other types of Why do you think behavior? there is a kind of game of hide and seek between duty and accountability? Why the scarcity or lack of accountability appears? I think part of it is lack of leadership, which is another issue, I think, um, that Nepal can look on. How do you look at? How do you create uh, a cadre of leaders um, who understand these issues uh, and who can make more responsible decisions? And um, and that's part of what we're trying to do is is with the younger generation collectively create a mindset of accountability and responsibility um, for the public good. Uh, I think it's not just Nepal; it's everywhere in the world, including the West. If people are left to their own devices, they will um, look to improve the conditions for themselves and their groups without thinking about the broader public. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the systems have to be in place, the rules have to be in place, but they have to fit the behaviors that exist on the ground. The problem is when the rules are far too different, too divorced from the realities on the ground, mm -hmm. people try and work around the rules, um, and that's when you get illicit and illegal behaviors. OK. So one more question I'd like to ask about uh, open border again. Uh, since uh, misuse of open border uh, comes uh, into let's say, the notice of the people, and which it uh, sometimes becomes an issue of, uh, you know, like uh, creating a bitterness between Nepal and India. Uh, what do you think, uh, as a student of international affairs and relations, can best be done so that no such inimical element can uh, be that much active enough mm. to create bitterness in the relation that lies between Nepal and India? Mm. I think, again, the first, the first issue is security. And there have been several examples of people on the Nepali side of the border who I think have dealt with this uh, very well. Mm -hmm. Pradim Nakaki, for example, mm -hmm. I think has done a very good job. Okay. Uh, Ramesh Karel has also done a good job in, in Parsa at looking at the security side of things and really cracking down on that. Mm -hmm. um, then it's looking at joint initiatives like infrastructure. I mentioned water management or a road across the border, mm -hmm. a highway that could really facilitate trade. I think that's really important. Um, and then it's looking at, at um, joint efforts to build understanding between governments, between civil societies, and between business, mm -hmm. um, and creating accountability processes and anti-corruption processes that can hold people with power accountable for their behaviors, and then monitoring those, those tools and those processes over time in ways that can be uh, constructive and lead to shared understanding. I mm -hmm. think the biggest issue between India and Nepal, in many cases, is a lack of trust. Mm -hmm. um, so what 
what mechanisms can we develop that can build trust on issues that, that aren't political and that we can uh, agree upon, that both sides can agree upon. And I think one of those could be water. I think there are a number of others, perhaps agriculture, various other um, issues and sectors. Tourism, I think, is a really interesting one. Um, and use those as the basis for then expanding this zone of understanding in the same way, for example, that the EU has done it or the US and Canada uh, has done it. Um, and then it allows for discussion about some of the more difficult issues. Okay, uh, because there is uh, kind of like, you know, not that open, but kind of open system between uh, Mexico and Canada, the border lies uh, between, between the Between the US and, and Mexico? Mexico, yeah. yeah. And uh, what kind of practices are being carried out there so that uh, they are having less threat in comparison to the threat that, that uh, open border that lies between Nepal and India is experienced so far? Well, I think the lesson from the U.S.-Mexican border, uh, which is heavily militarized now, and they're, they're putting up a fence across the entire length of the border, mm -hmm. is that a closed border doesn't solve the problems. Mm -hmm. They still have issues of, of people coming across the border illegally, of, of drugs and guns and so on coming across. So an open border or a closed border, I don't think it makes any difference when you're talking about some of these illicit activities. Mm -hmm. What does make a difference is working on some of the concerns and some of the causes um, for why these issues exist, like poverty, like lack of opportunity mm -hmm. um, in Mexico, for example, which sometimes drives immigrants up into the US. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the same with India and Nepal. What are the issues that exist that, that lead to some of the behaviors that we see? Mm -hmm. um, and, then, and then what are the solutions? I think too often we try and deal with the symptoms and not the causes uh, of the problems. Um, the symptoms are the crime. The causes are a lack of accountability. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there are some practical steps that can be taken. The financial systems, for example, um, in the US uh, have, been, have been monitored quite carefully to look at financing for some illegal activities. And that is all um, monitored now and, and enforced. How are we looking at that in Nepal and, and India? The financial systems that are used to launder money, the gambling, the various other activities that happen down in the Terai. How do we crack down on on those to prevent the money getting to the kind of groups that, that carry out some of these illicit behaviors. Mm -hmm. um, but beyond that, it's about creating jobs for young people, creating a sense of upward social mobility and opportunities so that they decide that it's more productive and more useful for them to go into a formal system uh, of employment in which they can earn a wage and, and have a happy life mm -hmm. rather than turning to crime and other activities which might undermine the government and the security of the region. Okay. So again, as a student of international affairs again, uh, when it comes to like, you know, creating that kind of disturbances or hurdles that eventually affect <coughs> the relation between the countries and among the countries actually, uh, what do you think could be the primary objective of, uh, you know, like working for that kind of uh, activities that eventually bring some sort of bitterness between the relation? How do we build? More trust, you mean? No, 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 no. My, my question is, uh, you know, the, these terrorist activities, uh, if you talk about terrorist activities, or even if you talk about kind of that inimical activities that are creating bitterness between the relationship, uh, in the relationship between the countries or among the countries, mm -hmm. what is the primary objective? What are they guided by, actually? Of the terrorists themselves? Yes. Are terrorists, be they, uh, are they terrorists or any other groups, armed mm. groups or so, mm. other kind of group? What do you think could be uh, the primary objective of mm. theirs? I think, I think religion, for example, and, uh, and other types of ideologies are, are not the cause mm -hmm. uh, of these problems. I think they are um, an excuse and a way to um, generate ill feeling and ill will. Mm -hmm. I think the cause in, in all cases is a sense of exclusion um, from power and resources. When you have groups, however big or small, that feel like they don't have a legitimate way of voicing their concerns, or, or that their feelings and their um, ambitions are not fed into the political system in a constructive way, mm -hmm. then they begin to look at how to overthrow that system rather than support it. Mm -hmm. And I think that is one of the issues that Nepal has seen. You have such a, uh, a diverse set of groups uh, and people in this country, which is one of Nepal's biggest strengths. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also where some of these groups um, feel perhaps that their voices aren't being heard, um, and therefore the system as it exists doesn't serve their interests. So that requires, I think, collective conversations, really inclusive conversations, mm -hmm. um, about what the vision for the country is and how we can help people uh, who are all Nepalis come together to support that vision rather than undermine it. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me ask you the last question. Uh, 
since uh, you're working for this uh, accountability lab, how how uh, how is your experience so far in the context of our country? How uh, successful you have been in terms of making the people you are working for more accountable mm. to uh, go through the job that they are assigned with? We think it's a very long-term process. Accountability is not something that happens overnight. Okay. Um, so it, it's really a generational change that needs to take place because I think it is about helping people understand this concept okay. um, and, and helping Nepalese who are really interested in this develop their own solutions. Uh, the Nepali people, of course, know much better than, than I do what the challenges they face are and what the solutions should be. So we're just trying to see if there are any ways that we can help them through drawing on international experience to carry out that mm -hmm. process. One thing I've noticed here is that there are many, many brilliant Nepalis. The capacity is very, very high. Um, the people here are incredible uh, on an individual basis. Somehow, collectively, at the moment, it, it isn't quite coming together in a way that is allowing Nepal to be everything um, that it should be. So we're, we're trying to bring people together, help them connect in the right ways, and see where joint ideas and collaborative initiatives might lead to positive change. I think we're having some impact so far. We're supporting uh, a number of really exciting groups to do, to do interesting things. We've set up an accountability film school where we're training young Nepalis to make films about some of these issues. Mm -hmm. um, we're engaging with um, the Right to Information Act and activists around that act to use it as an accountability tool to make information more transparent. So we're doing a variety of things and we hope that, that over time those will come together to really um, help everyone here um, develop a society in which they feel their voices are included and which decision makers are responsible. Okay. So, Mr. Glencors, thank you so much for your invaluable, you know, like views, and thank you so much for coming to our show. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, uh, it was Mr. Black Glen uh, Glencors uh, from Accountability Lab, and thank you so much for watching us, and keep on watching Himalaya Television. Namaste.